So let's begin with some prayers. Om Ajnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वांचा कल्पतरुभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य एवच पतितानाम पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नमः जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्री वासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा सो आई विल स्पीक ऑन द कंक्लूडिंग वर्स ऑफ द भगवत गीता विच द ग्रेट आचार्य रामानुज सेज इज द चरम श्लोका द क्रेस्ट वर्स ऑफ द भगवत गीता That is 1866. Sarva dharman parityajya maame kamisharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo moksha ishyami maashu chaha. So here Krishna is telling, surrender to me. Forget everything else. Just surrender to me. I'll take care of everything. I will protect you. So recently I was a part of a workshop given by multiple speakers. It was directed toward people who are not very familiar with Krishna. krishna consciousness with bhakti wisdom in general and primarily from a non indian background so the speaker before me had spoken out surrender to god and when i started we had some question answer session so the first question that came up one person asked he says why do i have to surrender to god i didn't even know that i was fighting with god <laughs> so <laughs> the idea was that the word surrender often has a martial connotation and when do you surrender you're fighting with someone and you can't win then you raise the white flag of surrender so that is that may be martial surrender in the battlefield context but what the bhagavad gita is talking about is devotional surrender and devotional surrender and martial surrender they are different in both their cause and their consequence in terms of cause when there is martial surrender it is because one realizes the opposite side is too powerful i can't win mm-hmm. that's the cause and in terms of consequence it's not at all a pleasant prospect no we don't know if we are surrendering to the opponent how they are going to treat us maybe after surrendering they may persecute us they may slaughter us they may torment us the fate of the surrendered is not very pleasant however neither of these two apply to devotional surrender in devotional surrender the cause is not frustration or helplessness the cause is affection the cause is love just like when two people are in love they may say you know your wish is my command what does that mean that i want to please you therefore i'll put aside my plans and do what you want me to do so that surrender is an expression of affection of love it is not forced it is voluntary so in terms of cause the devotional surrender that krishna is talking about is out of love and voluntary and in terms of consequence the gita describes and that's the whole message of the gita that actually god is our greatest well wisher he wants the best for us more than what we ourselves may want and therefore when we harmonize with the divine will then that that takes us to the best possible future so both in terms of cause and consequence devotional surrender is very different from martial surrender so in the bhagavad gita the theme of surrender comes on many occasions but primarily three 
So I'll talk about those three occasions and this 1866 verse which I came to, I'll come to it at the end. We look at these three senses in which the Gita uses the word surrender and how that can be relevant for us. So the, in the start of the Gita, there is surrender. Arjuna speaks in 2.7, says, Karpanya dosho pahata swabhava prichamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha yashreyasya nishchitam bruhi tanme shishyaste ham shadi maam tvam prapannam. So prapannam is surrender. So here Krishna is surrendering to Arjuna. Sorry, Arjuna is surrendering to Krishna. Hmm? Now, what is the context or what does surrender mean over here? See, Arjuna is confused about the right thing to do. Hmm? Arjuna is struck, afflicted by, a, by a agonizing ethical conflict. So, imagine somebody is a, is a well-established police person. And a reputed police officer, and a very fair, where they punish the criminals and always let the, uh, always let the innocent go unharmed and stay kept protected. And now somebody has robbed a house, robbed a, committed a big robbery, and they're fleeing. And then the police is chasing that person, and as the police come closer and closer and closer, and then that person slips and falls. Now police can. They shoot. This, this is such a terrible criminal that the government has given shoot aside orders. Hmm? So now they can just shoot and at that time this criminal turns around. And they say that the police person sees that that criminal is their own son. Now what do you do at such a time? Now should he act as a police person and shoot or should he act as a father and protect so there are two roles and there are two duties and they go in opposite directions. Similar was Arjuna's tension at the start of the Bhagavad Gita. He was a martial guardian society. He was like a police person and he had to punish aggressors. But those aggressors were his relatives. Among those aggressors were his venerable elders like his teacher and his grandfather. So, he has the bow and the arrow, he has raised it, he's ready to fight. But he confronts the reality, that these are the people who I have to fight against. What am I to do now? So at that time, Arjuna turns to Krishna and he asks, Prichamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha I want to know what is dharma. Here dharma means the right thing to do. What is the right thing for me to do? And, with, and he says, in asking this question, before that, in the first chapter, second half, as well as the second chapter, the half, the section before this, Arjuna has been giving his own ideas. This is the right thing. If not fighting is the right thing. I should not fight. I should not be greedy. Many reasons he is giving. But at the end he is confused. And then he says, I surrender to you. It's prapannam. So here in 2.7, surrender is the means to gain knowledge amid confusion. So surrender has different meanings at different times. So in the Bhagavad Gita itself, here it is, as a surrender is the means to gain knowledge amid confusion. And we all will face situations where we just don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Should I do this? Should I do this? Yeah. There are many definitions of intelligence. And one of the definitions is paradoxical. Is, intelligence means to know what to do when you don't know what to do. <laughs> now you may say, how is that possible? If I don't know what to do, how do I know? No, it is like, okay, if I don't know what to do, whom to turn to or where to turn to to know what to do. That is also intelligence. Like some people, when they are driving, driving is a functional activity. But for some people, it's like an activity of ego. So, if they are on the wrong path, they will not admit they are on the wrong path. 
they don't know the directions they'll not admit it they said let's ask someone we will be lost no no we are not lost i'm on the right track and getting further and further away from the destination no no i'll find the way so no at that time intelligence means okay i don't know what to do where to go so if i don't know what what where to go then what should i do i should ask someone who knows nowadays of course we have google maps but otherwise we ask some people over nearby if you are in an area where google maps or other gps systems don't cover you have to ask someone now it also requires intelligence to know whom to ask that's why it is intelligence it's intelligence to know what to do when we don't know what to do and that willingness to turn towards someone who is more informed or wiser than us or at least more expert in that particular area that willingness is itself an expression of surrender generally when we talk about intelligence in today's world much of of an intelligence is just reduced to iq is information processing ability how fast and how accurately can one solve math problems or do something some analytical questions that's fine that's one aspect of intelligence but the bhagavad gita defines intelligence not so much as information processing capacity as decision making capacity in the 18th chapter when krishna talks about from verses 30 to 32 about buddhi he says buddhi is about making judicious decisions so when one doesn't know what to do the arjuna exemplifies what to do that is turn toward the divine in prayer and submission to so, turn so now we may say that for arjuna krishna was right next to him so i don't have krishna next to me see it's interesting that although krishna was right next to arjuna krishna did not give a pat answer to arjuna krishna led arjuna through a process of philosophical and moral deliberation by which arjuna himself could understand the right course of action so krishna did not simply give an answer if that's what krishna wanted to do he could have finished the bhagavad gita in six words i am god obey me fight gita over he doesn't do that because krishna is not just addressing the circumstantial over there krishna is addressing the eternal so he in the bhagavad gita provides the framework or template for a process of philosophical and moral reasoning by which we can arrive at a proper understanding however that process begins with prayerful submission so when we don't know what to do we all have many decisions to make you no know, should i pursue this career or that career should i take up the, uh, stay in this city or that city should i be in this relationship or not in this relationship so many decisions we have to take in life and the nature of the human condition is that frequently we have to take huge decisions based on tiny information when say we want to pursue a career well how much can we know about that career beforehand well we know some things we should try to know as much as we can but we don't know everything and we can't know one car one particular career may be flourishing at a particular time but maybe we decide to pursue it 6 years 10 years down the line things may change in the industry in the market so how much can we know so if we decide to pursue a relationship with someone now how, we can try to know as much as possible about other other person but how much can we know actually in fact what to speak of we knowing the other person whether the other person knows themselves also is a question isn't it we ourselves behave in ways that we say oh i couldn't have done that so we are charles dickens said that every person is a mystery to themselves and what to speak of to someone else so we can't know but we have to take decisions so what can we do is we can turn toward the divine in prayer and submission that does not mean that we outsource the responsibility for decision making to god and then wait for some mystical signal that's not the mood of the bhagavad gita but what he says is when we turn in prayer and submission then we open our heart to divine guidance we when 
we let our intelligence be guided by God. So then, when we pray and deliberate, and then strive to make a decision, we'll find that we will be better guided. We'll be able to think more clearly. We'll be able to understand. So, practically also, surrender could mean we connect with those who are spiritually wiser than us. They, they can act as the representatives of the divine and they can guide us. But this is the first mode of surrender. Uh, first, not mode, the first way surrender is depicted in the Bhagavad Gita. That when we don't know what to do, we know what to do. Turn to the divine in prayer and then use our intelligence to, uh, to arrive at a wise decision. So that is the first case where surrender occurs. The second, now I said there are many places there are hints of surrender, but I am focusing on three because these three are distinctive. The second is in another well-known verse of the Bhagavad Gita, 714. 714 is says that divine indeed is this illusory energy it is almost impossible to overcome. But those who surrender to me, they can cross beyond this illusion. So currently, I am speaking tour of America. So about four years ago, before the pandemic, when I had come, I was in a city and I, I, had, a, like, I had a talk in one university. So, well, uh, so I did not know about that university beforehand. So while I was going along, I asked, which university is this? Says, this is the American Institute of Illusion. So, <laughs> this is a little taken aback, you know, it's an institute of illusion. So, the idea is that actually to make good illusion requires ability. So many movies are made, but most movies don't do very well. Why? Because the illusion is not very engaging and people get bored. So, to even make good illusion Good illusion, that means that will engage us, that will absorb us. That requires intelligence, that requires ability. So, Krishna says that the illusions that are there in this world, that sometimes delude us, that sometimes captivate us, they are not ordinary. That this illusory energy, Maya, is my energy. So she is manifesting God's intelligence. And that is why it is very difficult to overcome the illusions that come up in our life. So, what happens with respect to illusion is that we all have some illusions that we share and there are some illusions that we are particularly vulnerable to individually. Sometimes people ask, I was in Australia when I was asked this question that you know, if God wants us to do the good thing, the right thing, then why are there so many bad options? In fact, why are there more bad options than good options? So I said, that's how it always is in every multiple choice exam. Isn't it? <laughs> Normally four wrong options and only one right option. So the student in today's world may sue the teacher. His student may say, four wrong answers you gave, so 80% probability that I'll get it wrong. And you expect that I should get 40% to pass. Therefore, you have rigged the system for me to fail. Therefore, I will hold you responsible for my failure. Will that work? No. Because the choosing is not based on probability. The choosing is based on intelligence. Choosing is based on one study. So, yes, there may be four wrong options, but the test of the student is to be able to have studied sufficiently so that they can choose the right option. In terms of number, yes, the wrong options are more, but that doesn't rig the system against the student. So, similarly, in the world, there are many options. In fact, the world broadly serves two purposes. One is experimentation and the other is redirection. We all want to be happy. And actually we are made in such a way that we can be happiest when we connect with the divine in love. In fact, love is the purpose of existence. But not just the love that is talked about in romance novels and romantic movies. 
It is this is love that is enduring. That is love that is eternal. This is love that is uplifting. It is love between humanity and divinity. And then for that foundational love, love for each other. So that can give our heart the greatest fulfillment. But unfortunately, uh, we have our own conceptions of what will make us happy. And because of that, we try. Maybe I'll try this. Maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll try that. And we keep trying hundreds and hundreds of things. And so the world is a place where we can do experimentation. See, God does not want to force us. Say if a boy proposes to a girl, please marry me. And she says no. And he takes out a gun. If you don't marry me, I'll shoot you. Well, that won't be love. That will be force. So, God does not want to force us. That's why he gives us free will. And not only gives us free will, there is a world in which we can exercise that free will. And do what we think will make us happy. So the multiple options that are there, they are for us to try out our ideas of what will make us happy. And when we realize, yeah, some things make me happy, but it's not, it doesn't last for very long. It's just, see, many of the things that promises happiness, they are such that, that as long as we don't have them, we, we feel extremely discontented. So money is something we all need for living. But for most people, money is not just something which they want for a living. For people, money becomes their whole, not just the means of living, but the purpose of living. So m money is not just indicative of their net worth. Money becomes indicative of their self-worth. And then what happens? That the nature of money is that when we don't have it, we want it. And when we have it, we want it more. And it just leads to insatiable craving. It's like, and the same applies to sensual, the same applies to sensual pleasure. When physical, physical enjoyment through the senses people are seeking, there's some sociologists, nowadays people do surveys of everything. So, most people when they're engaging in sensual pleasure, most people they find they're bored. It's before that there is craving, but during the moment, it's like, okay, it's, oh, it's anticlimax. So most of the things we think will make us happy, they don't really make us happy. They give a little pleasure, but it, it disappears after some time. That's the law of diminishing returns. So suppose uh, there is food after this program. Well, don't suppose food is there, <laughs> but suppose there are unlimited desserts. Say maybe there is some dessert like gulab jamun. Hmm? So now what happens is, if we have this gulab, I want it. It's delicious. So we take one. Oh, wonderful. Can I have one more? Two. Yes. Three. Four. Now, suppose we have ten. You'll say, enough. Now oh, please take more. No, no, I don't want more. Now you take more. And then after the same thing, the first gulab jamun was irresistible. But if we take, if the twentieth gulab jamun is offered to us, the same thing which is irresistible will become unbearable. I feel like I'm going to throw up now. So, so is the pleasure in that object? If it were in that object, why does the 20th iteration of that object not give us the same pleasure as the first? So it's, yeah, it's not that the pleasure is not there in that object. It is not only in that object. It is in our imagination that surrounds that object. And to the extent that imagination gets depleted, to that extent, the pleasure also gets depleted. So the imagination gets dissipated. The imagination gets dissipated by collision with the hard rock of reality. Then the pleasure also disappears. So we have many things which you can seek for pleasure. But it is when we turn towards the Lord in devotion and then use all our talents and abilities in His service, we get the highest fulfillment. So, so this illusion overcoming that, we, may, we all have this understanding that, okay, certain things are good, certain things are bad. But we are unable to give it up. Hmm? So, uh, it's like, there was one, one singer, pop singer, he said, you know, like, you treat me badly, I love you madly. <laughs> you treat me badly, I love you madly. You know, that is the case for all of us. Pro 
probably we can say this with respect to addicts you know they get into so much trouble because of the object of addiction and yet they crave for it madly but to a lesser degree all our attachments are like that you know we get into trouble because of our attachments they because of them we we suffer but still we love them madly because that illusion doesn't go away that illusion just stays and he may say we may somebody may drink a lot and they get a hangover and it's such a splitting headache and such a noxious no, nauseous feeling i'm never going to drink again and within a few days the next party is there when are the drinks coming so what happens is the illusion stays on so krishna says the way out of the illusions that are bedeviling us is by surrender so first was more you could say ignorance about the right thing to do the second is illusion in terms of the inability to do the right thing there's a difference here i know what is the right thing but just when the temptation comes i just completely forget i just can't resist it seems like a f2 button is pressed in our memory delete and then whatever resolutions are there it all evaporated so to overcome that is surrender now what does surrender mean in this context here surrender basically means that we hold on to god through the process of bhakti through the practice of bhakti first surrender was openness to guidance but here surrender is like holding on if you are in a way if in a ocean and waves are coming the waves are giant they will buffet us they will knock us away we can't fight against the waves ourselves but if we have an anchor that we can hold on to then by that the strength of hold that anchor we will avoid getting swept away so we can't fight against illusion by focusing on how it is an illusion it it won't work if somebody says i'll sit and look at temptation and deconstruct it well no it will deconstruct our determination it won't work we have to direct our focus towards something higher towards something fulfilling so the practice of bhakti yoga enables us to focus our consciousness on god so when we chant the holy names when we hear spiritual wisdom when we pray and worship the deities when we come in sacred holy association by all this we are holding on to the anchor that is god and then whatever illusions may come whatever may divert us from our path those illusions will be able to overcome it's amazing and people all over the world have experienced there some habits they're struggling to give up some unhealthy habits and they couldn't and they started practicing bhakti and it's almost like magic those habits just seem to lose their hold lose their grip of course some habits take more time than others but the transformation happens so surrender is for protecting ourselves or freeing ourselves from illusion so don't fight with the illusion fight to hold on to god and god will fight with the illusions if we try to fight with our illusions ourselves they are too strong they will overpower us so that is the second mode of surrender the third mode this i'll conclude and we'll have few questions this is what krishna talks at the end he says give up all ideas sarva dharman parityajya maham ekam sharanam vracha now this literally this verse can be very confusing <coughs> why because dharma can mean many things so i was in india at a gita recitation uh, program they had asked me to give prizes over there and they were uh, this was a general hindu festival so they were reciting and when the kids were reciting this verse they said that the sadhus sarva adharman parityajya mame kam sharanam vraja so then i asked the organizers this verse is sarva dharman parityaj why sarva adharman parityaj so he said it actually it doesn't make any sense god has come to establish dharma god has come to establish virtue why will he tell everyone to why will he tell tell us to give up virtue he said say that we thought that actually when the gita was written down there was originally an a but that a was forgotten by some transcriber so we are putting back that a so now this is foolishness actually for arjuna there was no question of adharma he was a very virtuous person so it's uh, he doesn't have to be told to give up all adharma it's like a person who is extremely honest you tell them you know you should not murder and uh, murder people what 
You know, what are you talking about? So that doesn't make any sense. But Sarva Dharman Parityaja, what it means over here is that you have your conceptions of what is the right thing to do. Hmm? Just put aside your conceptions. Maam Ekam Sharnam Raja. Just do my will. So here surrender means doing God's will. And that is what, this is 1866, seven verses later, Arjuna speaks. And Arjuna speaks his conclusion, his understanding of the Gita. And what does he say over there? Nashto moha smriti labdha tvat prasadhan maya chuta sthito smigata sandeha karishye vachanam tava karishye vachanam tava I will do your will. So here surrender means doing God's will. So there are three incremental senses. First was turning to God for guidance. What should I do? Then turning to God for strength. When I know what is the right thing to do but I am unable to do it. And now it is not just we do the right thing but we do God's will. So now why should we do God's will or what does doing God's will mean actually? So in one sense here surrender is the way to fulfilling the highest human potential. See God is not like some arbitrary person like a taskmaster who will just tell us to do whatever they need us to do. Now God is our greatest well-wisher. So imagine if a parent gives, a, gives their child a like expensive computer and then now the parents also know this child has some interests, this kid has some interest in computer programming and computer like that. And then the child neglects the computer and asks the parents, what can I do to please you? What can I do to please you? What I have given you, use it. Use it. Use it for doing good work. So similarly, God's pleasure, doing God's will, what does it mean? It means using the gifts that God has given us for serving humanity, for serving God, for doing good in the world. Each one of us has gifts. But unfortunately, we devalue the gifts that we have. Why? Because we look at all the gifts we don't have. Oh, this person is smarter than me. This person is fairer than me. This person is taller than me. This person is thinner than me, slimmer than me. We look at all the things and we feel dissatisfied. It's like, suppose after this, after this program, we are going to have a food. Suppose it's a special menu where everybody has a different dessert. Somebody has gulab jamun, somebody has sundae, somebody has malpoa, somebody has um, a chocolate cookies, somebody has various things like that. Now we have a delicacy in our plate. But we are looking, what does this person have? What does that person have? What does that person have? And even if we eat what we have, it won't taste good. <laughs> it is good. It is tasty, but you won't taste it. Why? Because we are distracted. We are looking at everyone, what everyone else has. And that will keep us discontented. So here surrender, sometimes like I started by saying surrender means, oh, I just surrender. It's just, I quit. Well, that's not the exact meaning of surrender in the Gita. Surrender means I will do your will. So surrender in this context means that to do what we can with what we have now. So to do what we can with what we have now in a mood of service, in a mood of devotion. So we don't have to compare now, others may have far better abilities than they have, than what we have. Somebody may have more wealth than we have. Somebody may have better looks than what we have. Somebody may have sharper brains than what we have. But none of those things in themselves will make them happy. Will give them fulfillment. Somebody may have a lot of wealth. But their happiness will depend not on how much wealth they have, but on how well they are using that wealth. Otherwise, by misusing their wealth, they will create suffering for themselves. They will get into unhealthy habits, unhealthy behaviors. So they won't be happy. So similarly, for each one of us, what we have is not necessarily what we need forever, but what we have is what we need right now. So accept it and use it. And God will give us more. Surrender in that context means 
Krishna tells Arjuna, don't resent the situation you are in. Now don't think, why do you have to fight against your grandsire or against your teacher? You have been given archery ability. You have been given opportunity to serve humanity with your archery ability. Do that right now. So, later in the Mahabharata, Krishna tells Arjuna, in, a, in, a, in a, one of another difficult moments of Arjuna's life, that this difficulties and distresses come upon everyone in the world. It's upon the good people and the bad people. Among the, among the wise people and the other wise people. <laughs> so, distresses come upon everyone. But what differentiates the wise and the other wise is, the other wise people, in the midst of distress, they act in ways that makes things worse. Whereas the wise people act in ways that makes things better. So we may have some distress. You know, oh, you know, this person has more friends than what I have. This person has more Facebook followers than what I have. You know, that can be a big crisis of not just, uh, it can be an identity crisis for people nowadays. You know, I posted this and I got only 5 likes. And he or she posted and they got 25 likes. What is the use of my life? <laughs> it can become like that. But the point is that rather than worrying about this, you know, who has how much influence, how much followers, how much positions, we focus on, okay, that can be a source of distress for me. But what can I do to make things better? If I just crave for what they, do, what they have or lament about what I don't have, I am only making things worse. But what I have, I try to use it constructively. Use it in the mood of service. And we'll find that therein we will gain contentment. Now, if we just take the responsibility to use what we have in a mood of service, we'll find our life becoming, our life becoming filled with meaning and eventually filled with fulfillment. Now, happiness does not depend on what we have. It depends on how we use what we have. It depends on how we take responsibility for using what we have. And that, so ultimately doing God's will, it's not that God has to come in some mystical revelation and tell us, this is what my will is. Yes, there are certain things God wants us to connect with him in devotion. So praying to him, chanting his names, understanding the wisdom that he has given us, that is his will, definitely. But along with that, his will is that whatever situation we find ourselves in, we act to make things better. We act in a way, using whatever abilities we have to make things better. Srila Prabhupada is an example of this. Srila Prabhupada, in one sense, he was always a great enlightened soul. So he was not having ignorance or illusion. But the third mode of surrender, when he was in India, nobody seemed to be interested in the spiritual knowledge of the Bhagavad Gita. So what did he do? I am going to do God's will. So he decided to come to America. And he composed a song while he was coming to America. And what in that song he says, My dear Lord, I don't know what, why you brought me here. Why have you brought me here? I do not know. But you must have some purpose. So, Nachao, Nachao Prabhu, Nachao Se Mate. Kashthera Putali Jata, Nachao Se Mate. My dear Lord, make me dance. Make me dance. As a puppet, Master makes a puppet dance, make me dance. Now this is not giving up of one's independence or intelligence. Prabhupada was using his intelligence. Okay, here, here we can share bhakti more effectively. Here people are not interested. This is an opportunity. Prabhupada was using all the intelligence he had. And he was not thinking, oh, so many people are materialistic. This is a materialistic age. People are not interested. No, who is interested? What can I do to make things better? And if we try to act in that mood, if we try to make a positive difference, no one knows how much of a positive difference we can make. God can empower each one of us to do far more than what we think we are capable of. In fact, discovering how much of a positive difference we can make, that can be our life's greatest adventure. And surrender in the sense of that willingness to act in harmony with the divine will, to use the gifts that the divine has given us, that surrender is the, is the opening 
of the door to life's greatest adventure and that is what is signified in the end of the bhagavad gita where the gita says wherever there is krishna and arjuna that means wherever there is divinity and humanity united together there there will be prosperity there will be success there will be morality there will be fulfillment so this is how the gita is a guide book for life helping us to overcome ignorance to overcome illusion and to maximize our human potential and our contribution in the world thereof i'll quickly summarize i spoke broadly on the topic of surrender today so we talked about martial surrender and devotional surrender are different in terms of their cause it's not helplessness or frustration but it's a love and the expression of love and the consequence is not a uh, unpleasant fate but a intimate bond of love with the divine the first occurrence of surrender is in when we, when arjuna doesn't know what is the right thing to do in the face of ethical crisis and he turns to krishna for guidance so this surrender opens us up to the inter- definition of intelligence as to know what to do when we don't know what to do krishna doesn't give pat answers to arjuna but guides him through a process of moral reasoning so like that when we f- we, fa- we are faced with indecision we can pray to the divine and then with that divine light illumining our guidance our intelligence we can move towards judicious decisions the second definition is up to 2.7 7.14 that surrender enables us to overcome illusion that even when we know what is the right thing to do sometimes we get captivated by illusions the world is meant for experimentation and redirection so if we have our own ideas of what will make us happy the world gives us forum for that however <laughs> if we want to turn toward the divine we have that opportunity also so rather than fighting against the illusions that be developers we focus on connecting with the lord and he will fight against the illusions he will help us overcome our unhealthy hang ups or whatever it is that deludes us and the last was surrender means to do the will of the divine and god's will is what that is like a parent has given anything something valuable to the children want to, children to use it fully so god has given each one of us gifts so instead of looking at what gifts we don't have we focus on what we have and use them in a mood of service instead of feeling distressed because of our situations or comparison with others we think what can i do to make things better and if we act in this mood of service you know who knows how much of a positive difference we can make discovering that how much positive difference we can make can be our life's greatest adventure the gita is a call to each one of us to join in this ultimate adventure thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions yes please Hare Krishna thank you very much for the lecture i appreciate the lecture also all the teachings that you have online uh you touched a topic of changing habit or habit control in your in your talk today that with practicing bhakti habits of people are changing as if it's like a magic um do we have any documentation or measurement that could uh support that claim and uh that would be the kind of like the first part of the question and the second part of if there is no such thing is there uh is there a determination of having such uh measurement thank you yeah so if you say that bhakti practice can change habits is there any scientific study done to validate this well yes and no yes in the sense that there are several devotees who in sociology for example from florida university dr david brand will the study of regular mantra chanting and its associated its effect on one's mental states so depression and negativity they had a parameter for measuring that that significantly went down and as our movement is expanding 
you know it's attracting more attention so i think more studies will be done but beyond sociological studies like that uh, devotees follow certain principles so we avoid, as spiritual practitioners we avoid certain indulgences and so we avoid avoid meat we avoid intoxication we avoid gambling we avoid unrestrained sexual activity nobody is forcing us to do that the whole world is filled with temptations and still you see people living in this world and voluntarily being able to avoid them to a substantial degree so what is making it possible many of the people who started practicing this they were now i'm not getting into the moral value of what is right and what is wrong i'm simply talking about behavior over here that many people were eating meat and they stopped eating meat and it is not that there was a big struggle it changed effortlessly the people who were uh, the very fact that these four principles are being followed and not it's like a constant torment uh, it, it is being followed so that that itself would be a demonstration for some people may say oh these rules are so strict and all of these people are inhibited they walk. but no no it's not inhibition because every individual is free anybody can just leave krishna bhakti if they want and start indulging in whatever pleasures they want to nobody is keeping anyone by force over here the fact that somebody is voluntarily doing it indicates that they're experiencing something higher in life because of which these these uh, particular the pull of these particular pleasures is no longer that strong okay so but definitely further studies can and should be done and i think as our movement expands in terms of the history of religion krishna consciousness and bhakti yoga have been practiced for millennia in india but in terms of their interface with modern with with modern or post modern western western culture and western interface the krishna consciousness movement started about about 50 55 years ago so we are growing and definitely such studies will be done in future okay. yes please one sec one sec so prabhu ji we already have proof we already have statistics because when prabhu pada shila prabhu pada came to us his first disciples were hippies who were taking lsd and it was they have they were womanizers they were intoxicated most of the time and those people because of chanting and because of bhakti they changed so that proof is already there i think that, yeah, that is bhakti is Thank bhakti you. is what really helped them get out of all their intoxications and addictions Yes. So I just wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. It's definitely true. I just didn't mention that because one, that's not been so you could say empirical so, so, sociology itself was not developed at that time so yeah. much. So that's why it's not empirically documented in sociological studies, but it's a well known fact. If you talk with the first person testimony of people, then definitely we'll see that. Yes, please. Actually, I can give a first person testimony for that. So um At one point in my life I was on psychiatric medication for like mood stabilization uh but then I started hearing about Krishna and I started hearing you know how they say you should hear about him I started hearing about him listening to his bhajans reading about him and uh I completely went off medication never needed it again so it really works yes yes <laughs> Hari Krishna Thank you for sharing that wonderful Yes close speak close Hare Krishna Prabhu thank you so much for your class um just, what, sorry one minute i'll just yes. add one thing so we are not saying that you chant hare krishna and stop taking medication that is not the point over here because in some cases sometimes clinical depression may require medication but what happens is some people think med- you can't, can't solve mental health problems just by popping pills there is a multifaceted approach and sometimes when one finds higher meaning higher fulfillment then the pharmacologic pharmacological dependence may dissipate completely okay thank you uh hari krishna prabhu thank you so much for your class um so i you had made a very very interest very useful point actually where you said what can uh, especially when you're tempted with illusion you can ask this question what can i do to make things better so i've heard you many times and i try to implement this but i've re- noticed myself it's very difficult during the time i'm like super caught up with other things and maybe a few hours after i start think oh i remember hearing this so i'm curious how do i potentially um i would say keep remember it at that moment or how, i mean is it what's the strategy to actually remember at that point okay 
So if we want to act in ways that make things better, but in the heat of the moment we tend to forget and we act impulsively. So how, how can we remember that more promptly? Well, um, the pathway to greater self-awareness is through self-awareness. What I mean by that is that at least it is good that later we realize, oh, I could have remembered at that time. Hmm? Like some people, they commit some terrible mistake. You know, they, they may, like, you know, somebody may hurt us grievously. And then we go through a lot of hard work and finally we resolve. Now I'm going to forgive that other person. And then we go and say, I forgive you. And they ask, what did I do to deserve forgiveness? So they don't even know they did something wrong. So that is a terrible level of, we could say, self-unawareness. So even if we, after doing something that is that we will not be proud of, later at least we realize that is also a level of self-awareness. So you could put it, another way to put it, even lack of awareness or lack of self-awareness is a level of self-awareness. Because some people lack self-awareness and they don't even know that they lack self-awareness. So they just do foolish things, they do terrible, th hurtful things and we go on with it. So don't feel discouraged. Okay, at least later I'm realizing it. Now, what we could do is, sometimes we need external aids. So for example, if, you know, if there's some thought which you like, some words which you like, some point which you like, you know, maybe keep it on the notepad on your phone, keep it in a sticky note, or maybe read it every day sometime, read that thought. Especially the kind of obstacles that we face regularly, the kind of challenges which we face regularly. If we know those and we know what could help me to navigate this, then keep that accessible. Keep that accessible. So it's like wisdom is valuable, but Say, if you consider wisdom is like a weapon for fighting against illusion. Mm -hmm. If a soldier is on the battlefield and suddenly the enemy attacks, soldier can't say, hey, wait, wait, let me go to my tent, get my weapon and then I'll fight with you. No. A, a we weapon in the tent is of no use to a soldier in the fight. So the soldier has to have the weapon with them. So similarly, we have to find out what is the way we can keep the wisdom with us, accessible to us. So one way is also speaking about it. And if you speak about something to others, say if the typical people with whom we tend to sometimes act in ways make the things work, we speak this, not in the didactic, holier than without it, but in the mood of sharing. Then when we are acting in an impulsive way, hey, this is not what I spoke. Maybe that will check us. So create support systems, for supports for ourselves. That will help quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, hi, um, I'm Pranav and uh, hi, uh, so thank you for your lecture, I really enjoyed it. So myself, I'm a PhD and I'm working at UCLA right now and today's my first day, I really enjoyed it. So I have a question regarding the fulfillment and contentment you were uh, talking about. So um, the pleasure or the contentment that a lot of us are seeking um, on a constant basis through our careers is through career growth. Okay, so my question is regarding career growth. How not to um, get yourself trapped in the pleasures that come through career growth? So for example, in, in your work, you always, uh, you always try to work harder and harder so that um, you get to a position which is better than you, right? That's true. And with that, it also like, to reward yourself, you always try to go uh, to get yourself a better house, a better car, or if you don't have a house, you try to get a house, and okay. then you try to upgrade it, right? If you don't have a car, you try to get a car, and then you try to get a coupe or a Tesla, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So how not to fall in that trap of, you know, needing more while being in karma yoga and try to work more and, you know, not falling in that trap? Okay, it's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you for asking it. So. How can we, we pursue growth, but we can get trapped in pursuing growth? So how do we avoid that? See, growth is a part of the natural human condition. 
each one of us was just one tiny cell in our mother's womb at one time. Now there are millions and billions, billions of cells in our body. How did this happen? Through growth. So growth is natural, growth is wonderful. However, cancer is also growth. Hmm? The difference is that cancer involves disproportionate and destructive growth. It's disproportionate and that's why destructive. One, one tissue in the body starts growing so much that it starts damaging all other parts of the body. So similarly for us, we have different facets to our life. When, Yudhish, when Narad Muni comes to meet Yudhishthir, Yudhishthir has just been enthroned as the king of Indraprastha, he says that there is dharma, artha and karma. So he says, virtue, profit and pleasure. He says, O king, are you pursuing all these three in balance? Don't pursue virtue at the expense of profit and pleasure. Don't pursue profit at the expense of virtue and pleasure. Don't pursue pleasure at the expense of virtue and profit. So we could say these three things broadly refer to three aspects of our life. Virtue is primarily connect, cultivated through our practice of spirituality or bhakti. So that is temple and spiritual places like that. So profit is cultivated through our job, our profession, our career. And we could say in this context, pleasure is cultivated through our family and our relationships. So that's our, so our, the temple, the workplace and the home. All these three are important for us. And uh, if we want to grow in a way that is sustainable, all three should be growing. If we focus only on one thing, then what to speak of neglecting our spiritual side? Sometimes people become workaholics and they neglect even their relationships. They become very successful, but they're just lonely because they've ruined the relationships. So the, to avoid this being caught in this phenomena of growth, or not in the phenomena, in obsession with growth, we can, we can understand that growth has to be multifaceted. That, yes, Yes, it's natural if we have a house to want a bigger house. We have a car, we want to have a bigger house. That's natural. So, when does ambition become greed? Ambition becomes greed. So, when it is at the cost of virtue. Artha becomes lobha when it is at the cost of dharma. Artha, seeking artha is natural. But it becomes greed when we compromise virtue for that purpose. So yes, it's not that we are meant to be spiritual, we are meant to be lazy. In all areas of life, we are diligent, we are resourceful, we are active. Ambition is never the problem. It is unidimensional ambition. Ambition reduced only to one area of life at the expense of everything else. So that's why if we have well-wishers around us, guides around us, whom we can turn to, whom we trust, then they can help us find the balance. Because we may become, based on our particular conditions, external conditions and even our internal conditionings. We may tend to get imbalance in any one direction. So, uh, if, so both by our own introspection and by the guidance of well wishes around us, we can find the balance between these three. Okay? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. One quick one. Um, the what law of oh, now, now I lost my um, diminishing returns. I read about that in the ninth grade, and I found that it applied to most things. But but I found that it didn't apply to chanting Hare Krishna or reading transcendental literatures because I've been doing that fifty two and a half years, and they both get met better. They didn't diminish. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. So Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Prabhupada ki, Jai. Jai.